going live, 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 and we are continuing the discussion about responsible travel this this day, focusing on Nizna, South Africa, and uh, very pleased to be welcoming uh, our good friends Martin Hatchell from This Tourism Week and, and Greg uh, from the Naturally Nizna campaign. Greg, good afternoon to you. Hi, how are you? Good morning to you. Hi, Martin. Hello, Greg. I challenged Ron to, to pronounce your surname. <laughs> Vote? Vocht. 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 Well yeah. done. Well done. And, uh, good morning for you. Good morning to you, Ron. Thanks for, 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 for hosting us. Well, of course. It's uh, always good to hear from from South Africa. Uh, Greg, uh, Martin has uh, clued me in a little bit uh, about yourself, but can you introduce yourself to the world? Yeah, I'm CEO of Neisner Tourism. It's the um, agency that represents the Neisner brand. And um, we have a whole number of responsibilities. One uh, that includes building responsible tourism products and, uh, and a, a responsible um, campaign um, and experience in Neisner. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about how responsible travel is interpreted where you are? I think that um, it's, a, it's an interesting question to ask me because I, I feel that people are talking around responsible travel but I'm not seeing a, an in-depth understanding of it. And um, so it is rather an irritation to me and possibly why I accepted to come on here because I'm not here to, to be nice. I'm here to, to shoot straight and get to the bottom of, of what responsible travel is. I suppose it also does include what you're talking about. Um, you know, I'm very critical of accreditation. Um, I think that there are a lot of accreditation processes out there that are not accrediting responsible tourism. They're simply a button that you're clicking and, and it's appearing on your, on your logos, or on your brochures, wherever. And, um, but behind the logo and the brand and everything, there's not, uh, you know, I'm challenging whether, whether responsible practices are really regulated. So it's been your experience that we're just kind of ticking the boxes in our evaluation of responsible travel. Well, are we? You know, what boxes? Uh, you know, that's the, the guts of the conversation I'm looking forward to getting, getting into. Okay. Uh, well, one of the big issues that have come across our attention, and no doubt you're aware of it uh, for much longer than, than us, but uh, in the past year, the notion of canned hunting has come to the forefront uh, thanks to various reporting uh, reportage. What sort of uh, treatment do you have for, for wildlife in Nisna and animal attractions? Well, you know, animal attractions in the garden routes are very, very, they're, they're abundant. And there are any amount of experience uh, with animals that you can have. Um, there are so-called game reserves. There are what I would classify as a safari park. There are snake experiences. There are uh, rehabilitation centers. There are places posing as sanctuaries. Um, you know, it's it's a very technical subject, um, but it's very popular, very very popular. And one of the one of the advantages of uh, one of the very few advantages of the sanctuaries in this area, Greg, is that we don't have a lion sanctuary in Neisner. So not in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, you know, um, I must say that in, in the economic borders of Nasna, there are no animal experiences. Um, we do have, you know, there, there's a, there is a wolf sanctuary, but again, let's get technical. Um, in terms of, of the registration, if you have a place and you register it, you can register it in terms of, of the legislation as a sanctuary, as an exhibition center, a game reserve, a rehabilitation center, a breeding center. There are seven definitions that you have to register your organize your 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 facility according to. But but the very definitions themselves, the the, the wolf sanctuary. I challenge you whether it is registered as a sanctuary. One of the most basic 
uh, re regulations and requirements are that you have to um, sterilize all your animals. The sanctuary has a very, very specific uh, requirement. Um, a rehabilitation center has a very, very, very specific requirement. And Martin, you and I often talk about um, the perceptions of people. People come to South Africa and you have a wild animal in your care and you are saving, you are in conservation. Whereas it's not true. If you have an, a, a wild animal in your care, you are exhibiting a wild animal. You're not involved in conservation. You should be able to define how you are involved in, in conservation. You should, uh, it's not that you should be able to define it. You know, we, we have in this country a thing called the uh, Consumer Protection Act, which I think we haven't even started to think about, Greg, because it's just struck me. In the Consumer Protection Act, you are, are bound by legislation to make, uh, uh, to, to make sure that the promises that you make are equal to the products or services that you deliver. So perhaps we need to start asking these people and challenging them under the CPA, are you a sanctuary? You're advertising yourself as a sanctuary. Prove it. Yeah, well, then there's an organization like ours that um, has to accept membership and we are uh, obliged to ask for certain information. So there's a second uh, loophole. But let's get back to Ron. Here's our Ron sitting on the other end of the world and has got no clue. He basically represents a potential visitor. The potential visitor arrives here from a continent that is law-abiding and generally, we would like to think, um, compliant. Yeah. Um, and they would assume, I'm assuming that they would assume, if Ron arrives here with his whoever and he's, he gets in a, in, in a hired car or whatever and he sees an advert, a brochure that says, would you like to touch, would you like to be with a lion, would you like to walk with a cheetah, would you like to walk with a lion, would you like to pet an elephant, would you like to walk with an elephant, would you like to ride an elephant, Ron's going to assume that those places are accredited. Surely, that is the, the, the starting place. So, we're dealing with multiple regulatory dynamics. You've got the, the Protection Consumer Act that Ron and his representatives know absolutely nothing about. They're not aware of it unless they're well read. We yep. believe that, that only 9% of Americans have got passports because the country is so huge. And, and of that 9%, how many have come here? We know it's one of the fastest growing segments to South Africa. But again, that person comes here and, um, and they assume that if you are keeping uh, a lion and you're walking with that lion, it's, it's allowed. So um, I, I believe that we've got to start creating multiple strategies, but one of the most basic ones is educating the incoming person and, um, and, and being honest with each other and recognizing that accreditation systems are not addressing walking with a lion. You know, that's a conversation that we could possibly have right here now. Where is the conservation in walking with a lion? What are the dynamics in terms of canned lion hunting? Well, is the is there an understanding? Is there is the link made or not made that once you are walking with a lion cub and playing with the little baby lions, that eventually they grow up and then their fate is to be, you know, drugged and then shot as a can hunting uh, exercise. Uh, you know, or sold for their body parts. Or sold for their body parts. You know, to, to me the to me the question is: Are we aware of the eventual consequences of these actions? And uh, you know, this the the campaign against canned hunting has taken off on Twitter and recently was uh, uh, featured on 60 Minutes, uh, much to the consternation of U.S. viewers when we saw you know a lion being shot you know point blank by a hunter. I don't know what we call these people. Uh, are we aware of this? It can't be. That can't be in the ads for petting a baby lion cub. This is what happens eventually. Uh, yeah. What's the? What's the? Uh, we'll get into this in depth. Uh, but what's the awareness, first of all, of the the lion cub um, touching um, exercises and uh, and the hunting? Is this is this promoted in South Africa? Are are the two linked? Uh, 
Walk me through uh, how this is perceived on the ground there. Well, I'll, I'll start off, Martin can add. You arrive in, in any major airport in South Africa and within, within two hours of landing you could be with lions and walking with lions and petting, and petting little cubs. What you will, in, you know, you land in Victoria Falls within minutes of landing you can have access to any amount of playing with baby cubs. But you'll also be confronted with, with um, the same facilities saying that they are doing research to return the cubs to the wild and or return lions to the wild and that they are return lion uh, projects. Now I refer now to Animal Planet. Last week there was a week of Lion Week on Animal Planet. I don't know if you watched any of it, Martin. No, I didn't, I'm afraid. Um, I was blown away. Um, there were there was a program that started 8 o'clock South African time and there was a program that started 9 o'clock South African time. And the, the 9 o'clock program had volunteers working at a place. The, the 8 o'clock program had this project um, where the people were desperate. They were, they were taking in lines also from, from zoos. Um, they never had volunteer program. You could see that, that all they really knew how to do were look after lion. The 9 o'clock program had this program where clearly uh, um, they had money from researchers. Researchers were, were, were there. You saw that they posed this program and I'll challenge them. I'll challenge, I'll go onto Larry King Live and you bring those people from Zimbabwe and I will challenge them on live television anywhere in the world that what they, what they were presenting on one hour programs for an entire week was a joke. Anyone who knows about Lion knows that there's no ways on, I think it was 400 acres, 220 hectares, um, that, or that, yes, 180 hectares, that they had numerous um, uh, um, groups of Lion hunting uh, zebra, chasing uh, giraffe. Um, Martin, it was an absolute joke. Yet it was presented with all the integrity in the, in the world on on um, uh, Animal Planet. You know, let's just have a look at the um, Ron. Just you, you know, I have. Uh, I, I was kind of brought up with wildlife, um, and many South Africans of my age, Greg. I'm sure you too. Um, so you kind of un we understand, but I don't know if 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 somebody coming from the states would understand what how few lions you would get, or how many lions you would get in a, in a in a given area. In the Chobe, for example, the Chobe uh, is a, is a huge game reserve, uh, well, nature reserve area, wilderness area in Botswana. How many prides of lions are there in such a large area? How big is the area? How many prides of lions? And, and, and what is the natural, the, the technical term is carrying capacity of that land. Then also if you have a look at, Ron, do you remember the very famous um, film uh, Born Free? About, I sure do. About uh, um, uh, uh, Joy and uh, uh, Adamson, what was his name, Greg? Uh, Adamson? No, not Ron. No. <laughs> no. Um, he spent very large parts of his life rehabilitating just a few lions. And then his work was taken over by a, a, a fellow called Gareth Patterson, who's now living in Neisner. He's an Englishman, um, author of, of this book, The Secret Elephants. He's, he's done a lot of research on the Neisner elephants, but he's also done work on, on a, a lot of work on, on, on canned hunting. And Gareth spent many years rehabilitating just a few lines. When I say just a few, I'm talking about a handful. Um, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but it's, it's less than 10. Um, so to get an animal that's been habituated to man back into a natural environment, a social animal like a lion, which is expected to be in, part of a, in, in a pride, it is an almost Herculanean task. And 
the truth is that people who set themselves up as petting sanctuaries, uh, do they have the time, the money, and the resources to do what we know is a, a huge job with very small returns? Does that make sense, Ron? It does make sense. And the question I, I would pose is, you know, are you know, is this just kind of coming to the forefront of awareness and consciousness in South Africa that there might be a problem with this, or are you so, or is this kind of still deep in the deep and and mired that uh, th these are issues that are not really being talked about? There are, they are being talked about, um, and and I think many South Africans, like Greg and I, are frustrated because um, uh, the the uh, the trend towards petting petting um, facilities, uh, and because so many of us know about the uh, the can hunt, lion hunting, but the the truth is, I suppose that the vast majority of South Africans don't know about it, and don't I don't even know if they care to know about it. But the important thing is that the, that, that we sensitise the people in the tourism chain to it as part of our responsibilities as responsible tourism advocates. Greg? Martin, just to add, just to add what you're saying to what you're saying, I'm always reminded in this conversation to get back to basics because Ron said, you know, we've got to, we've got to actually remember that people listening to this conversation are battling to orientate towards South Africa. And um, South Africa has the most beautiful natural wonders to experience. Um, if you go down our, or up our west coast um, from Cape Town west along the Atlantic seaboard, there, there are amazing experiences that Martin could talk you through in detail, but they don't include these animals that people have been programmed to um, to perceive as um, the you know you come to Africa and it's lions the it, the excitement I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the uh, na the the animal planets of the world have programmed people to to say well when you see animals when you come to the wild you have to be what what you're going to see are Lions catching a antelope, whereas lions are sleeping most of the time. And for every person, let's let's be honest and say that there are some genuine sanctuaries, there are some genuine rehabilitation centres, but they are very few, um, and they are outnumbered by the people that that are not responsible in any way. But but for every dollar that is spent. Basically, going in and um, for every dollar spent at a at a at a sanctuary or a rehabilitation center or an exhibition center that is not honest and run with integrity and responsible, that is a dollar that's not going to a game reserve that is looking after a um, an environment, a conservation space that requires dollars, um, mm -hmm. and what. What I speak to Martin very often about is, and one of our challenges and one of our commitments is to start what we call a conservation index, which is very easily assessed. A conservation index will give any visitor the um, access, to, yeah, the tool to assess what contribution this place is is actually or what level of conservation they're operating at. So if a person is keeping um, a cheetah, um, the, they will independently be assessed and given a conservation index and they won't pay for it. They won't pay for that, that thing because the minute you have to pay for something, you, you've got certain rights and, and, and the whole thing goes upside down. So um, Martin and I are scratching our heads and working out how we establish a conservation index. Um, but I believe with the tools we have, um, the electronic tools we have today, and with the with our knowledge of the legislation, it's not going to be difficult for us to do. 
And I believe that the majority of our efforts should be focused at the incoming person. The people coming in should be educated to the very, very basic facts. And that is, if for every year, every moment of every year, you're going to be able to pet a cub at a particular place, surely, you know, it, it's, it's simple maths. Something's got to be wrong. Greg, just to, to simplify perhaps what you're saying, I think that the incoming visitor needs to know what the right questions are. What questions should I be asking when I go and visit uh, any one of these here on my screen? I've got Google Maps. And Ryan, just so that you know, can you see my cursor? Please, please right walk down us. At the bottom? Yes, walk us through this yeah. map. Where are we? Where are you? Uh, we're right down at the bottom of Africa. So, so Ron, you're, you're somewhere up here on the left-hand side of my screen, and in, in that little um, place. What's it called? The United States. And then um, the South Africa down at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and right at the bottom of South Africa, on the south coast of South Africa, a little town called Neisner, and that's where we live. We're going deep um, in the responsible travel, folks. <laughs> it is, um, uh, you can see uh, when Greg's talking, you can see a photograph behind him. Uh, that is the, 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 the town is, is built on a lagoon, or built around a lagoon. Um, An issue. Part of the... Network. Sorry, and I'm sorry. Correct, an estuary. An estuary. I, I know I'm going to get more than just wrapped on the knuckles for that. It's an estuary, and I'm I'm pulling in the picture now. You can start to get an idea of how big the estuary is. It's over 2,000 hectares. Is that correct, Greg? Yeah. Um, I'm talking to you from a suburb, uh, just a little bit overlooking the estuary, around about here where my cursor is, and Greg is talking to you from the CBD which is round about where my cursor is now. Um, the estuary here is part of the um, uh, the Neisner Hope Spot and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mission Blue Hope Spot, but also uh, part of the uh, Gardenrick National Park, which is uh, one of our national um, nature preserves, uh, wildlife areas. Um, it is the only unfenced national park in the country. Uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, about 160,000 hectares? Yeah. Uh, and running then, uh, from, uh, sorry, if you, Martin, if so you just, just run into uh, the uh, uh, Which is uh, now the area that the map is covered. Now much of this area is covered by, by the Garden National Park. Sorry, Greg, uh, continue. It's, it's the only national park that I know of in South Africa that doesn't have a fence around it and that has got evidence of wild elephant uh, roaming and then they're not you probably no tourist will will see those elephants it's only by chance but I think what what is significant about this discussion today is and why why Neisner it's a town that resides within a national park and it has the responsibility of um, living responsibly and um, and focusing on responsible tourism because if we don't live our lives in a sustainable manner um, the indicator species that reside in, in and that share the space with us will disappear so our barometer is and I always try and relate the brand to the to the indicator species and the indicator species are those red data species in the area that are tiny little things. One is a butterfly, Hippocampus uh, um, Oracrysops niobe. You've got a little seahorse, Hippocampus capensis. And um, there's the, the sand fanbors. There's, um, you know, there, there are numerous red data species. And the beauty of it is they are not these huge, big, cuddly lion or elephant or what excites people abroad. Um, so we have you. a That's massive. Funny. <laughs> Sorry, that's the most important point that you can make about South Africa. We are not the big five. The, South Africa is, uh, Ron, uh, the only country in the world which, in, in which one of the world's six floristic kingdoms resides within the borders of a single country. 
The world is divided into six roughly, rough, uh, roughly defined uh, areas where different types of plants grow. The boreal kingdom covers most of North uh, America and, and, and Western Europe, and I'm probably into Eastern Europe as well. Um, it's massive. The Cape Floristic Kingdom covers just the coastal area, no more than 100 kilometers wide, from about from just just west of Cape Town, just north of Cape Town, down that coast, along the coast where we live, and a little bit up to a little town about 300 kilometers from where we live called Grahamstown, where Greg went to university. So in that floristic kingdom, there are 6,000 different species of plants that we know of, just the plants. And the thing about, about living in South Africa and being involved in the nature of South Africa is that the big five, the lion, the buffalo, uh, the leopard, the elephant, and the uh, rhino, those are just part of the entire story. And that is so important because, you know what, I, I'm probably going to get shot for this, but if you really want to see big game, go to the Maasai Mara, go to Eastern Africa. There's so much more and such intricate detail that you can meet here in South Africa. And that is one before second, you even start. One second. Do, do you folks, would you say South Africa is home to the big 500 or the big 5,000? The big 50,000. No, I was going to say the big 50,000. You, you no, know, I always... Sorry, Greg, Greg mentioned the butterfly just now, the, the Brenton Blue Butterfly. It occurs just in one small area of just a couple of hectares. Here in Not the, even. In it's it's half, half, the size of a, half the size of a soccer field. That's one butterfly, a species of butterfly, which doesn't, which doesn't, um, uh, because a species definition, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't interbreed with any other butterflies. One butterfly that lives in an area half the size of a soccer field. And Martin, I'm going to give you a fact that I don't think you know. Do you know that the status of that Brenton Blue Butterfly Reserve has a higher conservation status than the Kruger Park? I didn't know that. No, I didn't. Yeah, and and. What I find about visitors coming to this area, when they come for the first time, they want to do that basic thing. I want to see a lion. I want to see an elephant. I want to see these big things that you see on National uh, Geographic and Animal Planet. But as one, as they start relaxing and they start becoming um, educated to the detail that you and I are talking to, the, the fame books, those 6,000 different species, um, they start, they starting, they start getting in touch with, with um, their roots, and and you you know Martin, you can wax lyrical on that, but people start realizing that conservation has very little to do with animals, and more to do or mammals, and more to do with the plants that support them and and the 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 ground and the geography uh, around that. Because one of my tests, very often, I come along and I do lectures abroad. I do a lot of lectures in, in Europe. And I start off with my lecture by saying, are you a conservationist? Are you an animal rightist? Or are you an animal welfareist? What are you? And it's a lovely test. Because when they give me their answers, I then start challenging them on things. And I start saying, well, if you are a conservationist, then... Do you believe in culling an elephant in the Kruger Park? And that starts a massive, massive concept. Do you care for the one species, the elephant, or do you care for many, many other species that can get wiped out by that elephant? And that starts the conversation. Because those conversations form the base and the foundation of responsible tourism in my life, where conservation uh, is is in question. Nuance, nuance. It, 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 the problem with the big five is that there is no nuance in settling that thing. There, is, there are so many aspects to every question in the natural world um, and in the social world. I mean, responsible tourism, I think, needs to be about making people aware of that nuance. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. In this conversation, we've we've touched on to so much, and um, the the we come down to a very basic thing. At any one time, a sample of a thousand people arrive in the garden route, the area that we live in, and that those thousand people are going to make a choice. And let's assume the choice is to go and walk with a lion. Um, of those 1,000 people, who doesn't want to touch a little and have a photograph with that little cub? Who doesn't want to? And when we, look, when we are talking about making a choice about where, where you're going, what facility, what experience are you going to go and enjoy, we have to have a very clear sign that suggests that these people contribute positively to the greater environment and it has to be done very simply um, and we we can't punch we can't withhold our punches we have to talk straight and we have to talk hard and and we have to be honest about those people assessing themselves and those people being willing to be assessed Well, I think we've raised a number of really important points here, and I hope we can continue this conversation. And, uh, you know, the things that strike me right now is the fact that we need a broader type of education about other places on the planet. And, again, speaking from someone in North America, you know, the question I'd like to pursue with you is, again, what questions should we be asking? And what should we be aware of as, as visitors and or potential visitors to South Africa. You know, thanks to this um, incredible modern technology of, uh, you know, video chats and being able to ask questions and being able to see one another across the world, uh, many travelers are planning their trips, you know, far, far in advance. So it's like um, <clears throat> thinking, about a, thinking about a foreign uh, destination to travel. You know, you may spend uh, months, years, uh, before you actually make that trip. So we are actually enjoying the planning phase you know, much more than ever before because we can really insert ourselves into the conversation and get the things we want to know. Where, I'd like to where, 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 I'll say this, I'll shut up. But you know, where, where, where the uh, sharing economy sites have got done so well, uh, Airbnb, couch surfing, is the idea that you're able to connect with someone. You know, you, you uh, the intermediary kind of disappears, you're connecting with someone. And I think we can use this to our advantage in the years to come to really make those connections with South Africans. You know, what do you want to show us? What are your stories? And how can the people who are doing good work in South Africa really extend that personal invitation uh, to visitors in, in your own country as well as abroad? You know, if we, if we, if we can get the people who are doing good work and, you know, I'll trust both of you. But if we can get them digitally literate, if we can get them to, you know, put themselves online, it is, it's a lot easier to retweet. It's a lot easier to share those connections. And I think that's where, that's where we can work in, in 2015. I'd like to propose that um, this introductory chat, um, it's gone on longer than, than we predicted. But I'd like to propose that we make a commitment to, to what I spoke of earlier, the conservation index. And because no matter what we're talking about, if we talk, if I go into our gallery and bring out a product, a handcrafted product, the, that hand product represents in, in Neisner, it represents a product that is giving um, an opportunity to to a, per, to a person, a local person, to earn money, and they've used local product, um, and it has been um, the, the the baseline of that product. The the, the raw materials are um, responsibly they either waste because one of our sayings is waste is a resource, so they're using waste as a resource to provide a saleable item, and and no matter what, we should be able to give that person a score, and if we have a chat once a week at a certain hour and we and we are consistent with that chat and we slowly introduce product and we slowly start 
um, bringing in the principles and underlying those principles and introducing them to people, I believe that the critical mass uh, will accrue and people will be able to start um, a shopping basket opportunity of getting these products and saying, well, I will go and see that. And we, in and, turn, and will be able to... Yeah? And starting to understand what questions they should be asking yeah. about the products they buy and the services that they consume. Yeah. Well, I think we're, so, I agree completely, and you know, we'll you know after we 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 wind up, we'll figure out a schedule that works for us, and and we'll make a, we'll make some sort of a plan, and you know, thanks to uh, thanks to Twitter and Wiki, we can kind of document this, and, and as I say, at the at the end of 2015, I think we can you know we can make a very strong case of whether the you know to what degree these conversations are working. Yes, yeah. Ron, can I ask you a question? Please. <laughs> you've you've clearly uh, you know you live this discussion. How has anything uh, the 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 intensity of this discussion? Um, what we've brought to the table is it the is it same old same old or or have we brought uh, something um, fresh uh, with integrity to to the discussion? I think you're right that a lot of the discussions tend to be quite stale and they kind of repeat old mantras. And this is anything but. So I think what you've brought to the table here is is quite a fresh perspective. And Thank you. So I think we're we're on the right track here. It's Great. Certainly keeping, it's certainly keeping me awake. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you, go, you go to those conferences where you have some speaker just t you know touting stuff that was said 20 years ago and doesn't take doesn't acknowledge uh, different types of awareness and you know. I'll just fall asleep. Whereas this well, I'm gonna throw, I think we can watch again. Well, I'm going to throw my part. My parting word is: I want to channel, challenge Animal Planet to be the first people who are assessed, because it they are the people. Animal Planet in Discovery, when they flight experiences and stories that. Um, they are proposing that something has a level of integrity, regardless of who shot it, whatever the agent was that shot it. They should subject that to interrogation and, and discussion. Because the particular lion story I'm talking about that ran from 9 o'clock onwards this last week, to me, was promoting... It, it, it's, it would never pass the test. I, I think if Martin had to go there independently of me, um, we would score it equally the same. They, they are putting out a, an untruth and representing something that is factually so far from reality. Well, your challenge has been issued, and I think we can uh, tweet this video chat to the folks there at Animal Planet and Discovery and ask for a response. And I think we can also take a look at you know some of these programs. You know, uh, you know, it certainly runs the gamut from from good to bad. And I think we really should take a good look at that. You're entirely right. We will wind this down here, Martin. Do you have any final words? I think just to say that uh, the conservation index uh, is definitely uh, we need to put it onto the wiki, the Planeta wiki, and uh, I uh, um, will take on that task uh, to, to at least start it so that we can we can have the conversation going there as well and I thank you both it's been very stimulating and uh, I'm just sorry that the light has faded in the room and you can't see me because I mean I am the best looking person on the show tonight <laughs> thank you thank you very much Ron you both are positively illuminating people so thank you very much thank, thank you, you both for watching uh, comments are welcome on our Google event page and the YouTube video and we will continue this discussion cheers